Welcome to the CEC Report for the 7th of August 2015. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Elisa. And on today's CEC Report, on anniversary of Hiroshima Nagasaki, threat of nuclear war, never greater, and there is a solution to commodities crash, Australia must go with the BRICS. So firstly, on the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, threat of nuclear war never greater. Now, uh, on the 6th and on the 9th of this month were the anniversaries of the 9th, August 1945 bombings of Japan. And um, of course, today, uh, we've just issued, our international organisation has just issued a statement, which you'll be able to get soon on our website, stating that we are th at the greatest risk of nuclear exchange since the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1962. And that we mean that very seriously. So this statement is intended to get an international mobilisation against the threat of global thermonuclear World War III. And so we'll go through some of the details of that today. Um, basically, there's a series of escalations against both Russia and China coming from Obama in his last period in the White House. It's very dangerous. Um, any number of a series of various provocations, any incident could trigger this. We don't know what it'll be. It could be something coming out of Ukraine. It could be something coming out of the South China Sea. Uh, it could be the US deployment of their missile defence shield in Europe, which is seen as a threat by Russia, rightly so, uh, or the modernisation of the tactical nuclear weapons which the US is carrying out, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Yeah, I think it's really important to stress to our audience, the problem we have here is the build-up of tactical nuclear weapons, specifically around Russia in the recent period, and the ballistic missile defence system that the US is installing on the borders of Russia. Mm. Um, also in the case of China and the South China Sea mm. provocations against China and the Spratly Islands and so forth, the, one of the problems there is that one of our senior analysts here in Australia said to me, the biggest problem is that there is no mechanisms in which to discuss how to de-escalate from these, mm. what's taking place in this area right now. And that means that the people on the ground, the ones flying the planes or in the, in, in the boats, the, like the ships, these nuclear armed ships and so forth, they don't necessarily know how to respond in circumstances yep. that come, around, come about accidentally. So mm -hmm. therefore you've got this very serious situation now where you've got not just the means for an accidental nuclear war, but you've got the more, the more and more likelihood that this can actually take place. And when you think about the fact that you know, the US is about to forward deploy 600 nuclear warheads mm. just on the Russian border, mm. you've got exercises taking place with nuclear warships, nuclear planes, stealth bombers and so forth on the, on the, back, on the front doorstep of Russia. This is where these sorts of exercises can provide the basis for some form of even unintentional escalation of a war. That's right. And just to mention that Operation Trident Juncture, these are NATO exercises which will involve 36,000 troops from 30 nations. It's the biggest kind of exercise of its kind in 25 years. And they will actually rehearse the use of nuclear weapons against Russia. So that tells you something about what they're envisioning in the period ahead. And also with the agreement um, with Iran, the peace agreement, the P5 plus one agreements being successful, Russia has said, well, okay, now you don't need to pursue the ballistic missile defense because it was supposedly, as the US said, aimed at Iran, the threat from Iran. Hmm. Uh, but Obama has said, we're still going forward with that. We're going ahead with it. This is something, at least, that we've put a lot of material out <coughs> in the past New Citizens. In fact, we've been warning people consistently of this buildup, particularly since we've seen this uh, this Nazi takeover of mm. Ukraine, which was a provocation deliberately sponsored by the US. Victoria Newland, the ambassador for, for Europe at that, came out and bragged mm. how, how the US has spent $5 billion, you know, funding about 2,000 NGOs in order to be able to bring down a democratically elected government so that they can push and use Ukraine as a tool to provoke Russia into some sort of action. Why is all of this happening? Mm. Well, first of all, there's an element of insanity here, but that's the nature of what you're getting in the world today, where you allow 
a monetary and financial system to dictate the, the livelihoods and the welfare of, of countries everywhere. It's also the fact that you have a new grouping called the BRICS, which is Russia, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South um, Africa, providing a counter position to this, which Russia is a key member of, mm -hmm. right? And this is a, a grouping of countries that putting national sovereignty first, mutual economic development, respect for international law, and a whole lot of policies that mean that if these policies are, are adopted, you don't need this global financial oligarchy anymore dictating to sovereign nation states. And this particular grouping of BRICS is gaining more and more support by countries that are looking at the West, the bankrupt West, and they're saying, we don't want a part of this. What's been done since the global financial crisis of 2007? Nothing. The world is becoming more and more indebted, mm. more and more, uh, you've seen what's taken place in, in Greece, where Greece as a nation has just been literally smashed. I mean, Greece lost its sovereignty when it signed the Maastricht Treaty, when it joined the European Union, but it's become a model for what's going to happen to countries in the world that, that continue to support the Western system. And the BRICS countries and associated countries don't want to have a bar of this. So when, as you're getting more and more countries moving towards and opening the Suez Canal, which we'll talk about mm. you know, in, a, in a later part of the show, when you can see more and more uh, countries moving away from the bankrupt West, then there's more and more likelihood that there's an insane faction will say, well, if we can't have it our way, we're going to create a war. Absolutely. And that's where Obama, mm -hmm. as a puppet of this, is mm. so incredibly dangerous. I mean, he's, he's a la so-called lame duck president. But yeah. a lame duck president, so because he's in this, you know, this twilight period of his presidency, but he's not a lame duck. He's still got a finger on the nuclear button. Yeah. And at the present time, the Congress is in recess, so he's yeah. got, there's no checks and balances. Yeah, this is the great danger. He's on his own for the next month, and this is, yeah, the threat of the so-called guns of August. So you have a congressional recess for all of August. The other factor because of the election period is that you have new appointments for the military. So people like the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey, who's been a calming influence in all of this, you know, war gaming, uh, he will be replaced in October. So we don't know what that's going to mean. Now, there have been a number of other warnings about such a Guns of August period, which actually marks the entry of Russia into the First World War on the side of Serbia on the 1st of August 1914. The Russian Duma chairman, Sergei Narashkin, did an interview with Izvestia where he said a third world war would be mankind's last. And he said that everything Russia is doing is intended precisely to avert such a war. Uh, you also had on the Austrian Netfrausen website a group of former heads of state and high level security experts, including Helmut Schmidt, the former German chancellor. And that was headlined, it is five minutes to 12, we're on the brink of nuclear war. And they went on to quote Mikhail Gorbachev, the former uh, Russian leader, saying, we will not survive the coming year if in this overheated situation someone should lose his nerve. I am not just blathering, I am really worried. Um, and of course, you know, it would be much different today than in 1945 because Back then, Japan didn't have the capability to retaliate. Today, Russia obviously does. And they have made it very, very clear that they have created and have deployed an undefeatable nuclear second strike. So any attempt by the US to use their ballistic missile defence to put off Russia's response to them using nuclear weapons would not work. Unfortunately, though, there's a faction in the US that still believes in US superiority in this whole area, and that's where the danger comes in, at least a mm. complete miscalculation through insanity. Mm. And that's what, you, how do you measure what someone's gonna do if they're insane? Yep. That's where the problem comes. And the other real um, risk point is Syria right now, because Obama recently made a decision that America will act, including with airstrikes, to defend rebel forces on the ground in Syria that are quote unquote friendly to the US. They're working in the um, war against ISIS on the ground there. Uh, and so they're effectively, even though they're not saying it's a no fly zone or they're saying it's not, they're calling it a safe zone and so forth. They're effectively creating such a zone. And of course, Russia has always said like in 2013, when this blew up and we, um, Obama had actually given the order to strike targets in Syria in 2013, mm -hmm. and it was wound back at, you know, one second to midnight. Uh, but the Russians have said this is breaching the sovereignty of Syria as it indeed is. So that's another threat to watch out for. 
So we're going to stop there, but next we're going to talk about how this threat can be diffused. Welcome back to the CC Report, where we're talking about the threat of nuclear war um, here on the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, yet again. Uh, but also we want to talk now about how this can be diffused, because it is the case that Russia and China do not want war, Syria doesn't want war. I mean, any nation you look at, they actually don't want that. And so we've talked a lot about the capability uh, of the BRICS grouping as you mentioned in the last segment, to bring nations together around the spirit of cooperation and development. And we want to talk about a concrete example of that. And we've been saying on this show that, you know, the BRICS nations, the bloc, is not just talking about development. They're setting up the funding capabilities and they're actually doing it. And the example we want to discuss is the new Suez Canal, which is an extension um, and um, widening of the Suez Canal to make it into two lanes of shipping traffic through that region. Uh, and this has actually just been completed and the inauguration just happened on the 6th. So we're going to show a quick video. You can watch the whole, um, just a clip from the video. You can watch the whole video on YouTube. It was from a 23 minute video from Nile TV and where this new Suez Canal is variously described as Egypt's gift to the world and as a miracle. So we'll just show those clips. The Egypt is the Egyptian human being. It was the secret of the success. The Egyptian people worked very hard. And every Egyptian loves his country very much. And we feel, when he feels that his country needs him, he uh, do everything and every effort for his country. This was the secret of the success. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> رهيب انا حاضر هذا المشروع من هو رمل وابتديت اعدي بيه واحده واحده كل شويه نخش المشروع دوت مش مش شويه ميه اتحفرت وبس المشروع دوت كان ليه حجم مجهود رهيب عندنا مرشدين المشروع دوت وهو شغال حركه الملاحه ما وقفتش ده دي اعجاز ان حركه الملاحه ما وقفتش خالص بالعكس ده كان في زياده في عدد السفن اللي بتعبر المرشدين كانوا شغالين المهندسين شغالين العامل اللانش شغال سواء العربية شغال من الولد اللي بيقدم لك الشاي ليه دور معاك مش عاوز ايه اكتر من كده يا ريت يا ريت يا ريت المصريين او كل جهة وكل مصلحة حكومية تمشي بهذا الاسلوب اللي احنا انجزنا بيه هذا المشروع لو احنا عملنا بالشكل ده كمصريين مصر مش هتطلع في خلال خمس سنين مصر هتطلع في خلال سنة بإذن الله So you see the real sense of intense pride that these figures have um, the second one being a pilot who was navigating through the um, the channel, you know, during and the, the fact that it's still all the transit through the canal continued while they were working on this is yeah. extraordinary. Um, others on the video talked about the spirit of amicability of the workers and the teams, including foreign teams that came in with the dredges. Uh, and another um, was quoted to say, "We will die, but this project will live on for hundreds of years." So it's a real um, sense of national pride and spirit, which we don't see much of these days. We see a little bit of it in Australia when people say, oh, my father worked on the Snowy Mountain Scheme, mm. which is the only national development project we had in Australia. But the, the sense of pride in building those large scale projects that last for generations, hundreds of years, if not thousands, mm. but hundreds of years. I think the spirit of cooperation amongst the workers was the, is the cultural optimism that comes with real leadership. Mm. I mean, you've had Egypt was smashed by the, the, the Arab uprising, you, know, you had the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a terrorist organisation, come in there, terrorised the place, and then al-Sisi acted to mm. bring about the unification of Egypt. Uh, but he, he immediately acted, at least unlike a lot of leaders, he immediately acted and said, we have to have 
economic development to really bring this country out of the mire. Yeah. And he did what was un impossible, you know. Well, they were meant to do it in three years and he said, nope, no, 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 we're going to do it in one, one year. Said, and yeah. when you watch this video, you see that in the video, all these yeah. different figures are saying, we didn't think we could do it, but we were insistent. And they worked around the clock. It never stopped day yeah. and night. And even, as I said, foreign workers and so forth coming in and giving their time. And the Egyptian <laughs> people funded it through bank issues. That's the difference between a general and an army, Elisa, <laughs> and politicians. Yeah, exactly. Right. One's, one's action, one's talk. Right. Yeah, so. exactly. And the results of it, because as you said, they knew that they had to spark Egypt after um, uh, the Arab Spring, or as our friend Dr. Ashraf Sabri called it, the um, Arab Winter. And you can see the interview we did on the CEC report with this doctor who set up a field hospital to service the people who were working and who got injured on the project. Yeah, I think, uh, just to be clear, you know, Egypt is not part of the BRICS no. formally, but the BRICS countries have had a lot of behind the scenes collaboration to help this project come. And the spirit that you see with what's happening in Egypt mm. is the spirit of co cooperation that's within the BRICS countries. That's right. And you have five countries here in the BRICS which are very culturally diverse, mm. but they're unified around the commitment to a principle, the principle of national sovereignty or this principle of what we call the Treaty of Westphalia, the advantage of the other. How can we cooperate with all our differences to mutually develop each other and mutually bring our populations to, you know, up, you know, develop them together? Yeah. And I think this is what's really uh, at the heart of the solution to this war chaos. I mean, all these countries like Russia, China, Syria, they're not interested in uh, the policies of the West. Yeah. They don't want war. They want internal economic development. That's what Putin represents. That's what Xi Jinping represents. What they publicly come out. Mm. Yet they're the focus of a war. And you see that governments that take that approach are popular. Putin's popular. The Egyptian leader's popular um, because that's what the people want. Obviously, that's well, what anyone would want. Cyprus and Greece is popular mm. up until you know he hit the brick wall that he did in the recent period. Of basically. The reality of Greece is it's been destroyed mm. as a nation. It no longer has sovereignty. Mm. sovereignty. It doesn't have a currency. Yeah. Right? That's the whole point of the whole Euro, Euro system, the, uh, the Eurozone system, is to take the currency or that expression of sovereignty that you need away from countries. Mm. You notice that uh, you know, um, Britain is part of the Eurozone, but it has its own currency. Mm, exactly. Right? Great. The, the, the pound sterling. Mm. We have our own currency here mm. in Australia. Well, we can use that current currency, as, it, as has been done in the past, by great labour uh, thinkers mm. to actually develop our country. Mm. So we, have, we haven't lost that expression mm. of sovereignty, so we, we yeah. need to do what's been done in uh, Egypt in our country as well. And Egypt, just beginning, they've, uh, they're building a whole development hub around the Suez Canal, which will include six new ports, two industrial zones, fish farms. It's an extensive, and that's just for that region, there's other projects beyond that uh, in addition but already they've so they've built this 72 kilometers of new canal deepening other areas of the canal they've halved the wait time almost for ships passing through the canal the revenues will triple that will come in for Egypt so it's just an example of what can be done now after the break we're going to discuss the Australian economy and how we can get it out of trouble Welcome back to the CEC Report. So we're discussing there is a solution to commodities crash. Australia must go with the BRICS. Um, so we've got a problem in Australia because our economy, minus the mining boom, you can see there is no substance to it. And um, just to give some updated figures which have just come out because the, there's a crash in commodities going on globally and it doesn't look like we're going to see the bottom anytime soon. Um, the downward slide in commodities prices is accelerating and has surpassed the lows of 2008. Um, this month the prices have reached a 13 year low. Uh, the Dow Jones, the head of the Dow Jones indices have said, has said this is one of the worst months in history for commodities. The Bloomberg 18 commodity index has fallen a huge 26% over the past year. And across the United States, it's, you've seen quite extraordinary layoffs in the oil and mining sectors. Uh, companies like, these are the big ones, Shell, Anglo-American, laying off tens, thousands or tens of thousands of workers in various cases. 
Um, the US oil field service industries just this year have made 80,000 layoffs. So obviously we're seeing the effects of this in Australia. I mean, you're particularly seeing it in Western Australia where you've got um, a real shutdown of what was formerly a really booming e economy. You've got millions of dollars of equipment, bulldozers and so forth that's just sitting idle in big yards everywhere and you go over there, everyone is extremely worried about what's going to occur. This is the flow and effects from the shutdown of the mining in the north of the state. Yeah. That's right, exactly. And you see it in the housing um, uh, situation where prices of houses in the northern suburbs are down by up to 30% and there's a 40% increase of rental vacancies. So obviously people are just leaving the state because the work isn't there. Some of them moved over there to get work. So this is quite a dramatic change. But of course, Craig, we're seeing job losses here, South Australia, everywhere. There's been a real period of, um, of loss of jobs over this recent... As you said, I mean, the shutdown of the, the single, single greatest sector that for our economy, the, the mining export boom, which has been going on for about 20 years now, is something that most people aren't, aren't familiar with. Mm. They haven't seen a depression. And this is what we come, we're now moving into because what is going to replace the income, that this boom income that we've had in the last 20 years? Elisa, we have to go back and look at the thing top down look at, and, and take some lessons from what Al-Sisi is doing in Egypt. Mm. We can have this country absolutely humming, but we can't do it with the minions we've got in politics right now. We need to have large-scale infrastructure development projects that are funded through national credits. We create our own credit internally, spend it internally, and create massive projects like Lance Endersby's Australian Ring Road proposal for high-speed rail right around the country. It'll become like a catalyst mm. for massive economic development on the inside mm. of our country. It's going to cost a lot of money in terms of money if you want to talk about stock markets and share prices and dividends and all that sort of stuff. But money is an idiot. Money mm. is only there. You have to control money and you have to direct it into the productive sector, mm. which is why you would create this money in the first place to really stimulate physical economic growth, stimulate manufacturing, stimulate farming, the whole lot. And you need a lot of you need a lot of money to do this. And it's not going to create inflation if mm. you put it into real productive enterprises. And this has been proven time and time again. You create the credit for internal uh, productive uh, infrastructure. You won't create inflation. You will actually create masses of a great degree of optimism for a start. As seen as seen in uh, what is in Egypt in the mm. Suez Canal, and you'll see a massive turnaround. We're in, a, de we're in a, a, a dying cycle right now of an existing financial and monetary system and mm. its associated economic system. Mm. We're going to get more and more bad news as we go forward. And the only solution is what we're putting on the table. We have to re-regulate the banking system. They're not going to tolerate us taking control of their system because Joe Hockey's made it very clear. You know, the role of government is not in banking. Government should have nothing to do with banking. Yet he's ironically part of, he wants to be part of the Asian infrastructure uh, investment yes. bank, mm. but nonetheless, the, the over the last hundred years of our history, governments shouldn't be involved in banking. And ever, wherever governments have got in involved in banking, you know, we've prospered. Mm. And if we join with the BRICS, we've got two of the biggest ports in the world just to our north, Hong, Hong Kong and Singapore, and we can have the Asian Express that Lance Endersby's talked about. Um, because I was just going to say, hundreds of the jobs that have just been lost in Melbourne and Adelaide are in the shipping industry. So we can get these ports developed, get people back to work in good, decent jobs and build our economy at the same time. Now that's all we've got time for this week. Call in for a copy to find out more on all of those subjects of our Australian Alert Service. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week on the CEC Report. Mm -hmm.